Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us this morning for our Eco Schools live lesson on litter and waste. So excited to have you here today with us and we're especially excited to have schools from across the whole of the UK here today. Hello to Scotland, hello to Wales, hello to Northern Ireland and hello England. My name is Catriona and I work for Keep Scotland Beautiful, which you probably have heard about if you are working on Eco Schools in Scotland. We are your charity for Scotland's environment and our job is to combat climate change, tackle litter and waste and protect the places that we love and live in. We do this through Eco Schools, Young Reporters and our litter campaigns like the Scottish Spring Clean. We work in Scotland, but there are charities just like ours across the UK who do the same work. For example, in England, there's Keep Britain Tidy, in Wales, Keep Wales Tidy, and in Keep Northern Ireland, Keep and in Northern Ireland, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. Each of these charities also does eco schools and anti litter campaigns, and we're all doing a special campaign for spring, which I'll tell you about how you can all get involved in at the end of our lesson. Today, we're joined by our friends from Keep Wales Tidy and Keep Britain Tidy, and they both say hello, and they will be here to answer questions later on this week on Friday and in the chat as well. For today's workshops, we're going to hear from my colleague Jamie and our friends at the Scottish SPCA, Auchendrain Historic Township, and from Keep Scotland Beautiful. You will need to pay close attention to the lessons because at the end of our morning together, we will share a quiz. And the prize is a virtual tour for either Edinburgh Zoo or the Highland Wildlife Park given to us by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. They will be here with us in future live lessons to teach us amazing things about nature on our coming live lessons on biodiversity and water. All correct entries will go into the draw. Now that's correct entries for all three questions, one question for each workshop. So remember to pay lots of attention during each of the workshops because there will be questions to answer afterwards. I'll share the quiz and how to enter with you at the end of our lessons. Before we get started with our first workshop from Chris from the Scottish SPCA, I have a couple of things to tell your teachers to help this lesson go more smoothly. If you have not already done so, you might want to mute chat bubbles and notifications to prevent distraction. And instructions on how to do this are in the technical guide we emailed you earlier. Um, if you have any technical issues, please email us at ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org because if you put your questions in the chat, we can't always find you. There's so many people here with us today. Remember that today's lessons are being recorded if you'd like to watch again later and captions are also available if you click on the three dots at the top of your screen. During our lessons this morning we will use polls and we have noticed that sometimes these don't work for everyone. If this doesn't work for you that's okay you can share your answers with us on social media at, at KSP Scotland on all social media platforms. Once you have answered a poll you can click at the top corner to make the pop-up box disappear. If you have any questions during our lesson, you can email us at ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org. That also applies if you are using the recorded versions to watch again. We'll answer some of your questions at the end of this lesson and the rest will be answered during our live assembly on Friday morning. I'll now hand over to Chris from the Scottish SPCA. Remember to pay lots of attention to the stories of all the animals that will be mentioned. Super, so good morning everyone. My name's Chris. I work for an organisation called the Scottish SPCA and that stands for, what that means is the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the organisation that I work for and we're going to be watching a video which is a tour of one of our centres as well. So I'm just going to share my screen so we can get started. So thank you very much indeed, first of all, to Keep Scotland Beautiful for um, inviting us to, to speak today. Uh, very much appreciate it. And um, thank you all for, for tuning in. As I mentioned, I'm an animal rescue officer. That's what I do for a living. And I work for the SSPCA. Some of you might have heard of the SSPCA, but for those of you that haven't, this is what we do. 
So we are most well known for rescuing sick and injured animals, animals that aren't very well, and also enforcing the law with regards to cruelty towards animals. We work with all different types of animals. That includes wild animals, domestic pet animals, and also farm animals as well. When an animal comes into our care, and there's a lot of animals that come into our care, we uh, have in-house experts, medical experts who rehabilitate them, uh, provide them medical care, and that leads on to them being rehomed into responsible loving homes and also released back out into the wild. And that's the best part of the work that we do. Another thing that we do in our aims to uh, prevent cruelty happening in the future is education on what we call prevention. And that's what we're doing now, but it also involves going out to schools, meeting up with you guys, uh, doing various different workshops and also working with older community groups and speaking to lots of different types of people about what to do if they find a sick or an injured animal. Uh, the you know, the, the basics of what to do with your pets at home. We talk about the fact that animals are sentient as well. And then finally, um, taking care of all of the animals and uh, all of the animals in Scotland and all of the work that, that we do in education and prevention, that all costs money. And at the Scottish SPCA, we are entirely fu funded by the public donations of brilliant, responsible people, kind people in Scotland, and we are a charity. So raising funds and generating all the money that it takes to, to take care of the animals um, is, is, again, a big part of our workload. So the way that it works, how that it works, is um, that if someone sees a sick or an injured animal, an animal that doesn't look very well, they will pick up the phone and they'll give us a call. And we receive 250,000 calls every single year. And those calls are answered by our brilliant expert um, staff at our helpline. And the, uh, the helpline is actually at our headquarters, which is in a place called Dunfermline. After we receive the call, uh, one of our frontline members of staff might even possibly be me or another animal rescue officer or inspector is sent out to help out that animal. And you can see one of my colleagues there helping a helping a big swan out of the road. Uh, what you can see to the right of that, uh, this is uh, an inv investigation called Operation Delphin, which is a collaborative uh, investigation with various different organisations, including the SSPCA and also the RSPCA, our sister organisation in England and in Wales. And uh, the, these puppies have been seized, these cute little uh, labradoodle puppies here, they've been seized and we are working hard to disrupt um, the illegal puppy trade and tackle the effects of puppy farming. Again, you can see our vets there at the top right, providing expert veterinary treatment and specialist care for all of the sick and injured animals that come into our care. And then after they've received their treatment, um, they will be released back into the wild or they'll be found new homes. And down in the bottom left there, those are members of staff at the Scottish National Wildlife Centre, um, releasing a seal back out into the wild. <clears throat> Just to the right of that, we've got one of our animal care assistants at one of our nine facilities. The animal care assistants, what they do is uh, provide the daily day-to-day -day care for all of the animals that are looking for new homes that we have living with us. That's everything from fe feeding and cleaning to providing exercise and love and attention, bits of training as well. Um, everything that is required to, to get those animals back out into loving homes. And all of the work that we do couldn't be done without the specialist support and the incredible the incredible support that we receive from our volunteers. And volunteers, they have a special place in the family at the SSPCA, uh, especially for myself, because I started my career working with animals as being a volunteer. So we are very appreciative um, for the work for the work that they do. And then hopefully with everyone working together, all of that work, um, that all results in animals 
that all results in animals finding loving homes for the domestic animals. And that's what's down there in the bottom right. Um, animals that have come into our care, receive all the all the um, medication and the training and all of the excellent husbandry that we provide, and then them ending up in, in brilliant and loving forever homes. So we'll do a quick quiz break now. So you, you've learned what we do and, and basically how we work. So we'll do a quick quiz break. So now you need to answer in the in the polls and the quiz break is regarding garden birds and the question is what season do you guys think it is most effective for supporting wild birds and so what that means is when in the year what season would you offer wild birds something to eat when do you think they would most appreciate that So I'll just let you. That should be. Seen lots of responses there. Good job. Yeah. OK, so the main response is. Well done, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bravo. Well done for all of the all of you that said winter there. Yeah, winter is the is the most effective time to help out the, the wild birds. And it's it's pretty obvious, really. The, re the reason for that is because there's there's less food generally around and also there's a little bit less uh, people that are willing to to help out the wild birds and scatter little bits of seed and all of that sort of stuff. So winter correct is the most effective time to be supporting wild birds so I am sure lots of you will have been kind enough to to do that and now we're sort of in a transitional um not sure not sure what the weather's like down in down in England today but we're in sort of a transitional season at the moment and in in Scotland it's starting to warm up so if you are feeding the wild birds you might want to be starting to slow that down so they can get in shape for the summer so well done next slide so we talked about what we do and we talked about how we work and now we're going to have a little look at where we work so the Scottish SPCA we cover the whole of Scotland anywhere in Scotland where there is an animal that needs help we will come out and help it and we have represented by the pink dots there we have um, nine different rescue and rehoming centres and that is where uh, the domestic domestic animals that um, that don't have a nice family, animals that are essentially homeless that 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 need someone to take care of them, they will be living with us in those nine centres. And you can see that they're distributed all over the country, also distributed all over the country, represented by the black vans. Those are animal. Those represent animal rescue and inspectorate staff who are all over the place. You know, on the front line helping out the animals. And then the, the, the wee hats there, they represent our education officers. So we reach every community um, doing, you know, um, uh, school visits and, and all sorts of sort of community groups and things like that. And also now in the modern world, we're doing things like this to reach uh, communities all, all over Scotland. And those little hats, they represent our education officers. And then if you look in the in the centre of Scotland there, you can see the, the little purple hedgehog that represents the National Wildlife Rescue Centre. What the Wildlife Rescue Centre is, is that it's a huge, it's a very big animal hospital that the Scottish SPCA uh, run. And that's where all of our sick and injured wild animals in Scotland will all make their way down to be rehabilitated and that's where they'll get the vet care that they need and then just to the right of that the 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 um little telephone symbol there that's our, our and that represents our animal helpline staff and that is where our head office is down there in Dunfermline so on the topic of the Scottish National Wildlife Rescue Centre what we're going to do now is we are going to switch over yeah. And we're going to watch a video from the Scottish National Wildlife Rescue Centre. So I'm just going to stop sharing. And reshare with sound. There we go. Sorry. 
Good morning and welcome to the Scottish National Wildlife Rescue Centre. This is where we rehabilitate wild animals that have been rescued by animal rescue officers all across Scotland. Today we're going to be talking to some of our wildlife care assistants about sick and injured animals that may have been affected by litter in their ecosystems. First we're heading inside to our small mammal care unit to see some of our spiky friends. So first of all, we are speaking to our wildlife care assistant, Jenna Lister. Jenna, who's your spiky little friend? This is one of the late babies that we've had coming this year. Um, it was found out during the day by a member of the public. Yeah. Um, we don't expect them to be out in the morning time. We expect them to come out when it's dark. Yeah. They're just, there's a bit of concern just the fact of how small it is for this time of year with it being the winter months. Yeah. So it came into our care just to get some TLC and fattened up a bit. So yeah. So that member of the public, they did a very responsible thing by getting in contact with us because they saw a, a nocturnal animal out in the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's great that they called us. And so what uh, what the guys at home, what we're talking about at the moment is specifically litter and how these guys can help us. Of all the animals in this room, was anything affected by um, by litter or by the human imprint on the natural world? Yeah. We have had, especially like around the time where the big females have the babies. We have had instances where they've found plastic bags and yeah. they've made a nest inside the plastic bag, yeah. which obviously isn't very safe for yeah. babies. So those baby hedgehogs, they ended up here? Yeah, yeah. Um, the member of the public had found um, the bag rustling, so yeah. she did the right thing calling it in, yeah. but then Excellent. the mother was disturbed. So. Right. Oh. So these uh, these hedgerows, including this little guy, how long will they be here, and what will what will happen next? Well, uh, each hedgehog is a complete individual case, so it just depends on the amount of time they're in care. Yeah. It depends if they're just coming small, then it's just a matter of time them putting on weight yeah, before they yeah. can go outside. Yeah. Some have wounds that they've come in with, mm -hmm. or they're maybe just really poorly from coming out of hibernation. Right. So. Basically, we get them up to the, the 550 mark, 550 mm -hmm. grams, right. and then they'll go outside into our aviaries, so then they can get used to the colder temperature again before they'll release them. Yeah. And they'll go to a support fight site as well. I see, yeah, amazing. Jenna, what is the issue uh, that affects hedgehogs the most, and why do they come into our care? A lot of the time, it could be that they've been stuck in methane, yeah. so it could be the green mesh netting that people have in their gardens. Mm -hmm. Or it could be football nets that people leave out, they right. get tangled in them quite a lot as well. Yeah. And also when there's litter. Yeah. So uh, as well as being responsible um, with the rubbish, what is the best advice that you can give to all the people watching if they want to help out hedgehogs? Well, a good thing would be instead of having like netting a lot around a lot of the gardens, you yeah. can just having small hedgehog poles. Uh -huh. Just so it's like a little highway, just so they can get freely in and out of people's gardens. Cool. Um, it would just be like leaving out some maybe dry foods, yeah. like hedgehog dry foods yeah. for them to like support them a little bit and some water. Awesome. And also clearing up like a lot of rubbish if there's any in the garden, but yeah. making sure to leave like cow's leaves and things because they can make nests yeah. and More natural. little beds in there yeah. for them. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll let you pop this guy back in his bed. Thank you. Next, we are speaking to our wildlife care assistant, Maddie Milburn. Maddie Milburn, um, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Uh, what are these little guys? So these are two of our feral pigeon babies, yeah. um, Zuno and Jerry. So they just come in and they're quite young. They've yeah. just been found by themselves. Yeah. So these the, these guys, they're not um, they're not ill, they're not sick or, or injured in any way. They've just been orphaned or lost their parents. Yeah. So yeah. They've just been brought in to be raised. Um, right. They probably wouldn't survive by themselves at this stage. We wouldn't yeah. usually see pigeons at this yeah. stage um, normally. And they, they came into our care because someone saw them. They called the number and one of our animal rescue officers picked them up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And so what will happen next for these guys? Uh, you know, what sort of care will they get? Will they get medication or what will happen? Um, so for these guys, we really just need to feed them up. Yeah. Um, get them to a good weight, get them obviously like with him, he's not got all his feathers. So yeah. once their feathers have grown in and they can fly, they can go outside yeah. and get used to the cold and then they'll just be released. Yeah. 
yeah, is this quite a typical um, uh, situation? Do, do you get a lot of orphan pigeons in your kit? Yeah, especially during the spring, but yeah. pigeons can breed all year, so we can get baby pigeons in at any time. Gotcha, yeah, fantastic. So, uh, we're, we're, right now we're standing in, in what is this room? What's um, it useful? So this is usually used for the younger pigeons. Super, super. And so what we are discussing uh, uh, today, what we're talking about is litter. How does uh, litter affect these types of animals? Um, so with birds, um, they could normally be trapped with ropes or string with the babies as a risk that the mums will pick up little bits of plastic and they could feed them or they could use it for the nest and yeah. the babies could pick it up. Yeah. Recently we've also had quite a lot of swans in. There's been a few oil spills um, from petrol stations that go into the water and once they're at soil they have to come in to be washed. Wow. Um, so then they're in for quite a while even though they may be healthy birds otherwise. Yeah. Finally, so for everyone who's watching this at home, is there any specific advice that you could you could offer uh, of how they can help these birds and relieve the pressure from the centre? Yeah, so um, all rubbish and any plastic could get put in the bin so it's not lying around so they could be picked up. Yeah. Um, yeah. so they can't get trapped or anything. So yeah. that would be really good. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. We'll let you get back to your busy work. Thanks, Maddie. And uh, finally, we're going to be speaking to our senior veterinary surgeon, Liam Reed. So, Liam, what is the um, animal that you find coming into our care the most? Coming into care, we see probably a, one species, hedgehogs. We see yeah. a, a huge number of them. We also see a very large number of wood pigeons, yeah. feral pigeons, and mallard. Yeah, lots of gulls. And is there, um, with regards to litter specifically, is there one story that uh, springs to mind where an animal has been affected by litter? Yeah, I mean, we, we do see quite a few um, over time. So one that immediately jumps to mind, we had a cormorant that came in um, very unwell, just looked really uncomfortable, really flat, had a look in its mouth and just saw the, the tiny little end of a little bit of fishing line uh, wow. sticking out from the beak yeah. um, and when we actually anaesthetised and radiographed the bird it had the largest array of like, tangled pieces of metal in its stomach, it was, it was quite um, unsettling to see how much this bird had swallowed wow. um, and uh, we were just unable to retrieve all of that sort of hardware um, and so unfortunately the bird had to be had to be put to sleep. So oh, no. things like that are quite sad when yeah. you know, this is a bird that in the wild has been surviving for who knows how long until it encounters something from yeah. humans. Yeah. Um, and it didn't it didn't need to die, you know. No. And and that sort of thing happens from time to time. So that gotcha. jumps to mind. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in terms of um in terms of advice that you might give give uh, everyone who's watching this, what would you say is the best thing that, that they can do to prevent or avoid or to help out with the specific issues that, that are affecting the centre? Yeah, so I mean, I suppose it um, sounds cliched, but uh, the whole leave only footprints mentality, yeah. so if, if you take something with you out into the wild, just make sure tidy up after yourself, like yeah. that, that simple really. Yeah. So the things that we see typically are things that people have um, left yeah. out in the wild mm -hmm. that they probably shouldn't have. So fishing hooks, fishing line, yeah. netting, um, yeah. piece of plastic, things like that. The animals have either been ingested or become trapped in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, just take your litter home. Yeah, brilliant. Well, brilliant. Yeah, but well, thank you very much for your time, Liam. Uh, very much appreciate it. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And that's all from us at the Scottish SPCA National Wildlife Rescue Centre. Thank you for taking the time to tour the centre with us. And thank you to all the staff here uh, for showing us around and taking the time to talk to us. Please remember to stay animal wise. Please be responsible with all your rubbish at home and all your recycling. Please remember to be kind if you can. Uh, feed the wild birds, especially during the winter months. And finally, be aware. Remember to uh, give wild animals the space that they need to be wild animals. And then finally, when things don't go to plan, remember to ask an adult that you know and trust to get in contact with the Scottish SPCA on 03000 999 999. Thank you very much indeed.
Super. So I hope you uh, enjoyed. Um, one second, please. There we go. So. We'll just go back to the map. Hope you enjoyed our tour there. So again, so all of that was shot at the Scottish National Wildlife Rescue Centre, uh, Scottish National Wildlife Wildlife Centre, and that is represented by the hedgehog there in the centre. And as I was telling, as I was talking before, we have a network of people and facilities that cover the whole of Scotland. Now, when you get to the border, when you get to England and Wales, and then obviously in Northern Ireland, which some of you are tuned in from, that's when different organisations take over. They do very similar work to us, but at the English border, that's when the RSPCA um, that's that's where they work. Then the same in Wales and then in the Northern Ireland, it's the, the USPCA. And um, we, we do work in very similar ways, but we do have different telephone numbers. So it's important that whatever region you're in, you know the right one to speak to. And then the results of, of all of the work that we do. So we have been committed to animal welfare since 1839, which if you do a bit of quick maths, that's coming up to not too far off 200 years, more than more than 180 years that we've been doing what we do. And this image on the left here, this is one of the first um, you know, jobs that our SSPCA inspectors were in called out called out to, and that's in the Docklands in Glasgow. But more recently, since January of 2022, our helpline has answered 352,000 um, calls, which with the pandemic is is a little bit a little bit um, under under what we would normally receive. But the the pandemic's affected us in in a few different complicated ways. Um, probably closer now at this point, we more likely received over 150,000 reports of animals in need that our inspectors and animal rescue officers will be will be sent out to to deal with. And then um, on the companion animal side of things, so obviously that's your pets, that's your cats and dogs and rabbits and things like that. We have rehabilitated and rehomed far over six six thousand different companion animals. At the um, National Wildlife Rescue Centre, 42% of the uh, of the animals, which tends to be are roughly around 10,000 um, 10, per year, normal normal sort of numbers, and 42% of those get rehabilitated and released back out into the wild. And since January of 22. Uh, 20, since January of 2020, sorry, our education department, our team has reached 62,000 people. So that's a breakdown in numbers. So a lot of hard work. So next we've got another quiz break. So slightly, slightly trickier now, but still on the theme of birds. So this quiz break is all about gulls. In the UK, we have six different subspecies of native gulls. Those are, those are seabirds, seagulls, you, you might have used that term. And I want to know what type of gull this, and it's highlighted with the red circle. And it's also um, in the in the photo on the left. So does do you guys know the name of this gull? So I'll just give you some moments. If not everyone can see the poll, so could you read the, the choices? Oh, that, yeah, that so the options are the options are um, so in the in the six there you're looking at a common gull, you're looking at a uh, black head gull, you're looking at a kitty wake, you're looking at the lesser black back, the big black back, and the herring gull. And there's obviously some gull experts. Oh, it seems like there's a bit of a seems like there's a bit of a debate in the in the poll. But it turns out you are correct. You are looking at a herring goal. So well done for all of you that answered that one correctly. Um, shout out to 
Mr. Johnston. Mr. Johnston got the answer right on that one. Yeah, that is a herring goal. Well done. So moving on. Um, how litter affects wildlife. So what was covered in our tour there? Um, what what Liam was talking a little bit that about there our head vet was um, how litter affects wildlife that that come into the center and what I see out on the road are litter definitely attracts uh, scavengers. It attracts things like um, like foxes and also seagulls out into the road, out into places where they where they shouldn't be, into more suburban areas, um, into your neighborhoods. And you know, the good way to tackle that is to be really, really responsible with your, with your rubbish. And in particular, be extra responsible with your rubbish at drive through restaurants, because that can lead to um, little guys like this little fellow wandering out into the road to go and investigate uh, the food that's available outside of the, the drive through restaurant. And what that can lead to is, is wildlife injuries, not only affected by litter, such as the poor wee hedgehog here that's got stuck in this plastic bag, but also just above that, um, this, uh, this, this um, uh, seagull here has actually got stuck in a football net. So yeah, as, so what we need to be responsible with is not just our rubbish, but also any sort of specialist sports equipment. If anyone's got anything like that, it needs to go in the garage at night. And what that leads to and how that affects us is, a, is an increase in animal admissions. And the most common one, by far the most common one, is to do with that sports equipment, in particular, fishing equipment. If anyone does have a football net, make sure you keep that in the garage at night. And if anyone's having any fishing, uh, any fishing equipment, definitely, definitely keep that in the garage at night. And obviously, take it home with you. Um, discarded uh, fishing lines, hooks, fishing nets, all of those sorts of things um, affect uh, wildlife um, in our areas very, very badly. And then also generally um, something that you maybe maybe might not have considered. Well, obviously the eco groups, you, you guys will have considered it, but some people might not have considered how our litter affects wildlife in the contamination of their ecosystems. So the poor swan here that you can see in this um, big sway, this big um, almost sort of created like a dam, but that's all of our impact on, on their um, natural world. And this swan has actually got stuck in this big pile of rubbish, which is all floated down in in the waterways to the to the end of this canal and you can imagine not only for the for the animal to fix the animal get it out of this situation and get it back out into the wild but also the general work that it's going to take to to fix that um yeah it's going to be a bit a big task and, and dangerous work as well to to fix that part of the waterway so that's how litter affects us and how you can help us and how you can help the wildlife and firstly to, to be kind, we, we already talked about um, feed, feeding wild birds in the winter. You can be kind, you can um, be, you can give wild animals the space that they, they need to be wild animals. And then also you can be responsible. And I understand that you guys are probably already doing this sorts of, sorts of stuff at home. I've learned that actually, that you guys in your eco groups, everyone at home is already doing that, is already being kind and is already being responsible. But please continue to be careful with your, with your rubbish. Put your rubbish in the bin and keep it in the bin. Put, um, just check in the chat. Yep. Um, yeah, put your rubbish in the bin, make sure you rinse out all your all your recycling um, and make sure it stays in the bin. And if you know, if bins do get blown over or, or you do notice that the wild animals and scavengers have gone investigating um, to, to rectify that problem as quickly as possible. And then just to just to be aware, be aware of how how we affect wild animals and how our litter and how our effect on the natural world can can lead to situations like this poor poor wee fox and then and then moving on we've got kind of a similar fox in a similar situation but luckily a happy ending so the, this poor wee fox is is one that we've helped out who's actually got his head stuck in in a in a in a milk bottle there and a two litre bottle of milk. So what's most likely happened is that that milk has probably spoiled and the the milk bottle has been put 
in the recycling with a little bit of something at the bottom and the fox has found it either by getting in the bin or maybe the bin blew over or, or maybe it ended up outside of the bin somehow and he's gone investigating to to get inside and get that last little bit of food at the bottom at the bottom of the milk bottle now luckily the the owner of that property and the person that saw that they knew what to do they knew to get in contact with the scottish spca and we've come and we got that got the fox out and released him and let him go so one last quiz break so last one i think this one might be the most most difficult one so we've got a hedgehog quiz break and the question is that it's a nice thing and it's a kind thing to leave something out for hedgehogs but what do we never leave for hedgehogs? So if you'd like to answer in the polls, what do we never leave out for hedgehogs? And oh, this one, this one obviously is a trickier one. Well, I will give you the answer just in case we run out of time. So the correct answer, and just to be clear, this is what we do not leave for hedgehogs is milk. Yeah, hedgehogs are completely lactose intolerant. So please, please don't ever leave a dish of milk for a hedgehog. Dish of water is a nice thing to do and anything containing fish and that includes cans of tuna and that includes fishy cat food. Actually, dog food, um, dog food, any sort of cold meat, ham type things like that, that's actually not too bad for hedgehogs. We actually use those sorts of things to, to rehabilitate hedgehogs. Um, they are uh, carnivorous, they're, they're little meat eaters, um, but yeah, they are, they're lactose intolerant. And if you, if you did leave out milk or anything fishy for a hedgehog, it might lead to them getting sick and we, we'd have to help them out. So well done to those of you that got the answer right on that one. So, um, So uh, if you've got any questions, do pop them in an email and get them sent over to Katrina and she will pass them over to me. I believe that we are doing a Q&A session a little bit later. So if you get those questions in, I'll be able to answer them. Uh, there's also lots and lots of brilliant information on our website. If if you do need our help and you're in Scotland and things don't go to plan, uh, this is our website. There's, t there's tons of very, very useful information on there. And if you do have any kind of animal related emergency, you can reach us on 03000 999 999. And that includes a, you know, a sick animal that doesn't look very well or it's injured. If you see an animal that, it, that, was, that was bleeding or anything like that, or an animal that was stuck somewhere. If you saw a farm animal that wandered out of the road or, or anything like that, if you have an issue that's relating to an or an uh, urgent issue, an urgent emergency that relates to an animal, get in contact with us on 03000 999 999. If you are not in Scotland, if you are based in England or in Wales, you can reach the RSPCA on 0300 1234 999. Not as familiar with that number. And then last but not least, before uh, before we move on, before I say goodbye, so we have an activity for you. We have an activity over the next week. You guys are being tasked with designing a litter monster. I've had my go uh, just here. Uh, and what you can see is, um, uh, you can see my funny little litter monster here. It's called the Barhead Bag Filler, because that's where I live. But we want to know what is your monster's name and where do you live? What litter will your monster find where you live? How does your monster find the litter and pick it up? Mine uses some spiky litter picker feet and some extraordinarily long legs. And then what animals does your monster protect? What animals do you have in your area and who will your little monster be protecting? So yeah, that's what you're going to be working on today. 
and also over the next week. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of your litter monsters. And so that's it uh, from me. Thank you very much indeed for all your particip participation today in all of the polls. Well done, and I'll stop sharing my screen, but lovely to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I really enjoyed that, especially love seeing hedgehogs. They're always my favorite. Um, you said you wanted to see everyone's litter monsters. So I've got one first. Oh, yes. First, if you have any questions for Chris, please do email them us to us at ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org. We'll have a few minutes at the end of today's workshops to answer as many questions as we can. And the ones we don't get to today, we will get to at our assembly on Friday morning. So if you have any questions, please do send them in. I noticed there's a couple in the chat. I've got those too. So <laughs> this is my litter monster. I'd love to see yours. You can find us on social media and at, at KSB Scotland if you want to share your litter monsters with us and or you could email them to us. This is the kind of thing that we love to see and we'll share as many of them as possible at our assembly on Friday. My litter monster is called the obliterator, haha, because obliterate means get rid of. And of course, litter is what we want to get rid of. And she's got litter picker hands, big twirly eyes and big tires to go on all kinds of terrain. So we're going to take a break just now. I'm sorry, we're a couple minutes late. We will return at 10.45. Um, well, if you're not going outside for your break just now or you don't have something else to do just now, you could work on your own litter monster or you could try solving one of our two puzzles that I will leave up. Each of them I'll leave up for half the break. OK, so first we have a word scramble and the second is a spot the difference puzzle. Now it's time for our second workshop. If you're following along with our yarn dollies activity today, um, right now, I mean, you can have your yarn and your scissors ready, but don't worry if you're not starting this activity right now, that's OK. You can always do it later today or at some point during the week. OK, our seven circled. Excellent. <laughs> right, so now I'd like to introduce Karen Baird from Auchendrain Historic Township. Remember, for the quiz at the end of the lesson, please pay lots of attention to what you will hear about children in the olden days. Over to you, Karen. Good morning. Can you see me all right? Yes, we can see you, Karen. Right. So hello, my name's Karen and I'm going to tell you today about a place called Auchendrain. And as Katrina said, remember and listen out for information, especially about what children got up to for the quiz later on. So Auchendrain is a historic farming township in Argyll in the West Highlands of Scotland. And people lived there from the 1700s until 1967, although we think people may have lived in the same area as early as the Bronze Age. So first question, do you know how long ago the Bronze Age was? I think Katrina's got a little poll for you to answer. So there we go. Was it a thousand years ago? Was it two and a half thousand years ago? Was it four and a half thousand years ago. So are we talking 1021? Are we talking in BC? Let's see what you think. We'll give you a few minutes to answer. A few answers popping up. Bit of a split in opinions at the moment. Ooh, stay fairly even. Right, so if you said that it's about Four and a half thousand years ago, then you are correct. The Bronze Age took place approximately from 3300 BC until 1200 BC. So well done if you got that one right. The people who lived here in Auchendrain were quite poor, but they were very good at making things go a long way with very little waste. So first, let me show you what it looked like. Look, it's a little video to let you see what we've got. So here we have the whole of the UK, so I hope you can see the area that you live in. And if you look to the northwest, you'll see a little orange marker, which is Auchendrain. And we're going to zoom in until we're hovering right above the township. Just get to get to that point. Here we go. So 
So the road that's left of our picture now is the A83, which is the main road running between Furness and Inverary at this point. And down in the left corner, you'll see the car park and the grey roofed building is our visitor centre. But all the other buildings you can see there are part of our museum. We'll go to have a look around the buildings from a slightly closer angle now. We start with the visitor centre, which is the white building. It's the only building on site that's not a historic building. There's the first one of our houses. And as we swing round, you'll see the hill where the cattle were put out to graze over the winter months. As you can see, not all our houses are still intact. This one was built in round about 1745, so it's not got a roof anymore, I'm afraid. This wooden shingled house that we're just starting to see is known as the new house. And it was built for the family who stayed in the little house up behind that tree just at the back of the picture of them. They always called it the new house, so we do the same. The traditional houses were called long houses, basically because they're long. And they each have a good room, a kitchen and a byre where the cows or horses would sleep overnight. And a little room known as the closet between the room and the kitchen. We might call that a box room. And it was used in various ways as a spare bedroom, as a dairy and as a storage area amongst others. Cool. But Scotland was the only place that had small farming communities like this one. At one time they were common over much of Northern Europe and many other countries. They didn't all operate in quite the same way, but the general way of life would have been very similar with just local variations. And they continued from medieval times until the 18th or 19th centuries. Here in Scotland, townships were small groups of families living and working the land side by side. And although the land would have been rented from the local landlord, which in our case is the Duke of Argyll, the people were free to farm it in their own way and to move away to another area if they felt like it. But the system in the other parts of the United Kingdom was quite different. For instance, in England, the people were known as serfs. They still worked the landowner's land for them, and they would probably still have had a small patch of land to grow their own vegetables, but they couldn't leave their working place or move to another area. So it was almost like a form of slavery for them. But finding out about the lives of these people is quite tricky, because even 150 years ago, people were really good at reduce, reuse and recycle in their own way. We only find tiny parts of things left behind at Auckland Dream we find the things that were put in the midden. Midden is a word for a rubbish heap and it would have contained things like vegetable peelings from the kitchen. It would have contained broken things, bits of paper, all sorts of things that were left to rot down. Um, so we quite often find bits of broken plate or we find a battered old boot that's got so many holes in it, it couldn't be repaired anymore. And sometimes we find tiny fragments of metal toys but we're excavating, but these are more modern, only about 60 to 70 years old. And we have found one or two bits of broken china dolls, like this little hand that you're seeing. And this is the remains of the tract on the other bit. So the children disappeared, they left so little trace for us. There's the remains of the tractor. It's really hard to work out as a tractor, I'm afraid, for the picture, but that's all we have left. Toys were very expensive and they would mostly be homemade. But even then, it's unlikely that the children here in Auckland Drain owned more than one or two toys. But another little question for you to think about. Can you guess how many toys children in the UK have owned by the age of 13? So in total, how many toys will you have owned by the age of 13? 150? 300? 500? What do you think? Ooh, lots of responses for this one. Well, we're, at the moment we're fairly evenly split between 300 and 500. I'm going to put you out of your misery. In 2019, a study was done which showed that by the age of 13, the average child in the United Kingdom has owned around 500 toys. And a different study showed that in average, children only actually play with their 12 favourites out of that 500. 
We often drain children would have had no electronic gadgets like you have. They would have had very few toys and these were mostly homemade. Games would have been the type that you might play in the playground, so things like tag or hide and seek or hopscotch and skipping. Dolls would have been made out of cloth or wool and they may have been made in dress from bits of old clothes. Boys would often have toy farm animals carved from wood by their fathers. And although China dolls and lead soldiers would be available, these were very expensive, so most families couldn't afford them. Marbles, however, would have been made from clay dug up from the ground locally and cooked to harden at the bottom of the fire in the kitchen range. This is one of the ones we found at Auchan Drain. You can see it's just rolled up into a little ball and then coloured. We've got another one, which is a slightly different looking shape. It's a bit lumpy, but you wanted your own marbles back at the end of the game. So this was an easy way to tell them apart. The colours would have been done with natural materials or they might have used the keel, which is the sticky coloured paste that farmers use to mark out different sheep for a market, for instance. But it wasn't just that the children here didn't have many toys. They didn't have much time to play either. Everyone would have walked to and from school. And for the children here in Auckland Drain, that might mean a walk of an hour or more each way, depending on which school they attend. When they got home, they would be expected to help out. So collecting eggs, shelling peas, spinning, helping to muck out or feed the animals. And that wasn't just for older children. You would have started helping out with that sort of thing when you were in nursery. When they did get some free time though, they would have lots of outdoor activities, things like making daisy chains or playing in the burn or stream, for example. But it's not just children's toys that we rarely find. Clothing would have been repaired until it was just no longer possible to repair it. Children's clothes would have been handed down to younger brothers and sisters or cousins or neighbours until they started to fall apart and couldn't be worn by anybody. And even older children would sometimes be given adult clothes that were cut down to fit them. When the clothes were no longer wearable, the cloth would still be used. They would have been turned into things like dusters or cloths for cleaning the house or something that cats going to show us a picture of now. I want you to see if you think you know what this is. I tell you the coloured bits are made of cloth and the back bit is made of hessian, which is something you make sacks from. So tell your teacher or the person next to you, what do you think this is? I'll give you a minute or two to think. Ooh, but a few people with ideas. Lots of suggestions. Well done, those of you who said it's a rug. This one isn't actually finished. The pattern would eventually go right out to the edge of the Hessian, but it's made by putting little tufts of cloth through from the back and tying them off, and you get a rug to put in front of the fire. Bits of rags were also used to block up gaps in doors or window frames or walls and keep the drafts out. You can see there a bit closer the tufts in the rug it makes it easier to see. Things like woolen garments, so jumpers could be unpicked, the wool would be used again to knit something else, and shoes would have been repaired at home for as long as possible. And it's quite likely here that in the nice summer weather, the children just went barefoot to save their shoes for another time. Earlier on, I mentioned that we sometimes find parts of broken plates in the midden, and the people in Auckland Drain were very fond of a type of china called spongeware, particularly the ones with flowery patterns. So this plate has a motto on it, and it says your E is worth to fill than your wain, and that means your I is harder to fill than your stomach, implying that it's easier to stop being hungry than to have your fill of looking at the world. Spongery is created using a sponge with a pattern cut into it. The sponge is dipped in paint and then applied to the item to create the pattern. It's a bit like doing potato prints, which you might have done at school already. The most common colours used to create sponge wear were black, blue, red and various shades of green. Designs were usually applied around the edge of the plate, but sometimes a version of the pattern would be put in the middle as well. You'll notice that most of the designs use natural colours and designs for the patterns. 
The artists creating the plate would have used things that they were used to seeing for their inspiration. Lots of flowers, birds, and we're not quite sure whether this is a cow or a deer. You can make up your own mind. I thought it might be fun for you to design and make your own plate. Designs can be easily made by drawing a large circle on a piece of paper so you can try out ideas. Your teacher will be able to download an activity sheet with all the instructions after the lesson if you would like to try that. Woods an area where people now tend to be more wasteful than in the past. We are also concerned about things like food miles, used by and sell by dates, the overuse of ready meals or fast food. But these were all things that would have been a complete mystery to the people of Auckland Drain. There's no such thing as a supermarket for them. You did all your shopping in small local shops. So you would have gone to the butchers, the bakers, the greengrocers and so on. And for the people here, that meant a walk similar to the school one. So it took a large chunk out of your day if you needed to go to the shops. It wouldn't have been done very often and it would only have been done for things that they couldn't produce themselves. So if you think of things like sugar or tea, toothpaste, tobacco, shoe polish, they couldn't make those, so they had to go and buy them. But no one just popped out to the shops. You had to be fairly self-sufficient in those days. Food miles is the term we use for how far a food has to travel to get to the person who's going to use it. If you think of bananas, for example, they have to come to Scotland from Latin America, from the Caribbean or from Africa, and they travel an average of five thousand miles to get here. The Auckland Drain people had very little access to food that wasn't produced locally. They would have bought things like tea or sugar, but almost everything else they used was produced on their land or in the local area. So there were little or no food miles to worry about and definitely no plastic packaging. Your shopping would have been wrapped in paper and put in your own basket to take home. And you can be sure that when they got home and unwrapped it, people here reused the paper for other things. As a community, they grew barley or oats and potatoes, which everyone shared at harvest time. Apart from that, each house had its own kale yard or vegetable garden where they grew anything else their family might want. In that, they would have grown things like turnips, beans and onions, apples, plums, rhubarb, amongst other things. Quite a large variety. This is one of our kale yards. This one belongs to the little house with thatched roof. And this is part of our outdoor team picking nasturtiums. So with nasturtiums, you can eat the flowers and the leaves and the seeds. You'll see that there are different areas in the garden. There would have grown fruit brushes, there would have been vegetables, and there would have been herbs. <coughs> a large variety of foods were grown, as I said, but you couldn't have these things all year round the way that we can. You could only have fresh foods when it was actually ripe, so only at the time of year that it would be available. They would have been able to get things like honey, fish and shellfish locally. They would have had eggs from their own chickens and milk from their own cows and sheep, which they would have made into butter and cheese. Their oats would have been used for oat cakes or bannocks, and some of the barley would have been made into flour. Bannocks are a scone-like flatbread, which are common in Scotland and the north of England. Wheat flour had to be bought as our guy was too wet to grow wheat successfully, but you could make pancakes from either type of flour and then cover them in your own homemade butter and jam, which does sound rather nice. But some of the things you eat regularly would have been a complete surprise to these people. They didn't have access to things like bananas or oranges or peppers, for instance. And even tomatoes would have been unknown as you need to grow them in a greenhouse here. Almost all the food they ate would have been produced in Scotland and mostly in the area directly around where they lived. But their meals would have varied much more with the time of year. Potatoes were harvested in October, for instance, so there would have been plenty of fresh ones at the end of August. However, after that, they could only be used for as long as they could be stored. And I'm sure you've seen what happens to potatoes that have been stored too long. They start to sprout roots. Other vegetables could be pickled, like the ones you see in the picture, so they could be used over the winter. Different fruits would be available at different times from the start of summer onwards. Rhubarb would be cut in spring and then again later in the summer. But do you know when? fruit should be eaten when it could actually be harvested and eaten here in Scotland. I've got another little question for you. So can you match them up? You have apples, plums, raspberries, brambles, rhubarb, strawberries, and can you eat 
them and get them fresh in May, June, July, August or September to October. Have a little think, match them up. And then shortly we'll show you if you're right or not. We're very lucky that we can have all of these fruits all year round now. <clears throat> Your answer's popping up. You seem to be quite sure about apples. There we are, folks. Did you get them right? Fruit would have been eaten fresh, of course, but you could only eat so much when it's fresh. So lots of the fruit would be turned into jam, which could be stored more easily. Apples could be stored and would partly dry out. So if you imagine a little wrinkly apple, it doesn't look very nice, but it tastes fine. Which brings me to a very modern outlook on fruit and veg. Many shops have now started to stock wonky fruit and veg. These are the ones that have grown in a strange shape or they aren't very attractive in some way. So if you have a look at these potatoes and carrots, you can see that they're not all the same size or shape as each other. There are slightly bumpy ones, um, slightly bendy looking carrots. But people long ago would have thought that avoiding these was a really strange idea because it didn't matter what the fruit or vegetables looked like. It was much more important that it fed people. Meat was also something that couldn't be kept for long when it was fresh. They didn't have any electricity, so there was no fridge or freezer. Meat would usually come from an animal in the township that had been slaughtered. So they kept cows originally and later they kept sheep and regularly had one or two pigs. When an animal had come to the end of its life for being used for breeding or for milk or wool, it would be slaughtered for meat. And some of the meat would be used for fresh, but most of it had to be stored. So we have a large stone barrel in Ock and Drain, which you can see in the picture. And it was used for something special to do with storing food. So what do you think that's used for? Tell your teacher and let's see what we think it was actually used for. It's about a metre high, roughly, and a bit about three quarters of a metre, maybe about 75 centimetres across in diameter. What was it used for? Oh, some very interesting suggestions. Lots of mixtures of things. Some people on the right lines. Well done, I am going to put you out of your misery and tell you that it is a salting barrel. So it's used to preserve meat and salt. The meat would have been cut up and packed tightly into the barrel and then covered in brine, which is basically salty water. A bit like the water you get in a tin of hot dogs. The brine had to be regularly checked and changed if it showed signs of going bad. And this method preserved the meat for months at a time and it was usually only done twice a year. However, to actually use the meat, you had to soak it in water overnight to get most of the salt out, and then you had to cook it really slowly, otherwise it would be terribly tough. Smoking was also used as a means of preserving food, particularly bacon and fish, and it's still a common method of preserving food nowadays. The process has changed very little since people not and Graham were doing this in the 18th or 19th centuries. But now I would like you to picture your own kitchen at home. I want you to think about all the things you have to help the house work. So your cooker, your kettle, toaster, washing machine, fridge, freezer, all these sorts of things. Think about what you have in your home. And we're going to watch a very short video showing you our kitchens. Look for things that are familiar. Look for things you don't expect to be in a kitchen or that aren't in your kitchen and look and see if there are things missing that you would expect to be there.
The paper flowers in the windowsill there would have been bought from the gypsy traveller woman who sold them round the doors. And these built in beds are called box beds. And the children would have slept in these ones because this is in the kitchen and it was the warmest part of the house. As we swing round to the cabinet here, you'll see some more of the flowery china that the people in Auburn Drain love so much. And those little wooden bits are butter stamps, so you could mark your own particular brand of butter before you sold it. We're going to swing round to the range, and you can see the kettle hanging above the fireplace. And as we swing down in the, ba the basket there, you can see peat, which is what the fire would have burnt with. People at Auckland Drain had their own peat bank they could cut from. I think we'll come back to the beginning of this one. Sorry, Karen, I tried to pause it where you wanted to look at the range and it didn't work. <laughs> That's OK. We'll just look carefully as we go around again. I'll warn you it's coming up this time. <laughs> so here we are. So just after we go from the, seeing the plates a bit more closely, you'll get a look at the range. So the fire was built in the grate at the bottom and pots and kettles were hung on a metal bar with a hook over the fire. So we'll see that in just a moment. Here we are, you can see the bars at the top of the fire grate, the kettle hanging a hook. As I said, they burnt peat in their fires because they had their own peat bank. And that's what's in the basket. You get a better look at the range there. So the fire would have been in that centre section there, below where the kettle is. This is us going to another of our houses. This is Eddie's house. This is the house the people moved out of to go to the wooden house. And as you can see, one of the box beds here has been taken away to leave a bit more room. The round thing sitting below the window there, which we'll see again in a moment, is a butter churn. As we swing back round, you'll get a better look at the butter churn. There we are, that sort of round thing that looks like it has a tray in the top. And this photo gives you an idea of what it would have looked like when people lived here. So you can see Freya, Freya cooking pancakes on a griddle over the fire. This is where their water would have come from. So large rainwater barrel or directly from the burn that runs through the village. And your eggs would have been stored in straw until you were ready to use them or to sell them on at market. Very different from your kitchen, isn't it? These people had no electricity and they mostly had no running water. The second kitchen you saw in the video had one tap that gave cold water that came through a hose pipe from a stream on the other side of the main road. It was the only house in the township to ever have running water indoors before the most modern one, the wooden one, was built in 1954. In the past, all meals would have been prepared from scratch and there was no microwave or even electric cooker to speed things up. Food was cooked in a pot over an open fire in the range in the kitchen. Meals would have been simpler than our meals nowadays and would have varied more with what was available rather than what people felt like eating. Children didn't get to be fussy about what they ate. You ate what mum had made for dinner or you did without dinner. Simple as that. And there would rarely be leftovers. But if there were, they would be part of the next meal. So vegetables would go into a soup or a stew. Fresh fruit that was beginning to go soft would be put into a pudding. In the same way, things like vegetable peelings would have been fed to the pigs or put in the midden and composted down and then put on the kale yard or the fields a couple of years later to help the produce grow. It was important that fresh food was used as soon as possible to get the most benefit from it. And there were no sell by or use by dates to give you guidance. And housewives then would have thought they were silly anyway, because as you grew up, you learned to recognise the telltale signs and sounds that showed you that food was beginning to smell, to spoil. 
Most foods would be used immediately, with only the amount needed for that meal brought in from the garden or from the storehouse. Girls would have started learning to prepare and cook food as soon as they were big enough to reach the kitchen tabletop. Boys would have been less involved in the kitchen in those days. They would have been learning about farm work and how to care for the animals. But they probably saw enough cooking being done as they grew up that they could manage on their own when they finally left home. So I would be interested to know how many of you actually know how to cook. But I'm going to put a bit of a condition on it. So how many of you know how to cook at least three different things, but you're not allowed to include making a slice of toast and you're not allowed to include making a sandwich? So if you put your hands up, your teachers do a rough count and they can let us know whether it's less than half of your class, whether it's half the class or whether it's more than half the class. Oh, and I'm pleased to say that lots and lots of you have done cooking. That's great. Oh, maybe we have some trainee chefs in our group this morning. Lots of people. A real mixture. Oh, wow. One school has just told them 98% of the class is cooked. That is brilliant. I love that. In the days that people lived in Auchan Drain, they couldn't afford to be wasteful with their resources. Um, and it makes studying their way of life really tricky. It's always full of gaps where we don't have the evidence to explain what happened. So I wonder if we were able to fast forward 100 years, do this lesson again with somebody else sitting here, obviously, learning about you, what would people be able to learn about what your lives are like from what you're going to leave behind? What would they learn about how you dress, what you play with, what your life is like? just from what gets left behind. So now we're going to have our little activity. So if you have your wool and your scissors and things handy, I am going to show you how to make a woolly dolly. So these woolly dollies, which you can make in all different sizes, depending on what size your book is, would have been made by mums, for little ones, or even by the older children, because they're really easy to make. So, let me just get all my bits handy. I'm going to show you how to start it off. And then once we've done the first step, you're going to get a little rest, and I'm going to show your teachers how to finish it, so that you can finish it at your own speed, and you don't need to worry about keeping up with me. So the first thing we need, ball of wool, small book, I've got a wee notebook. The doesn't matter what you're going to wind it around, it will just alter the size of your dolly depending. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to tie a loop round the book. Make it near one of the ends because later on we're going to have to slide it off. So nice double knot just to make sure it doesn't fall off while you're working. Just get mine to tie. So we're just tying it round. And now, if you hold this loose end with your finger, it stops it sliding about. We are going to wind it round and round and round the book. Try and keep the bits fairly close together. You don't need to make it too tight. And you want it to be probably about two fingers width. So when you think you've got enough, like this, we're just going to cut off the wool down here. And we need one long bit of wool. Like this, which we're going to tie it together. with. Okay. So don't worry if you haven't finished winding round, just listen to what you're going to do with this bit. And then you can finish that while I show your teachers the other bit. Let me just move the camera down slightly because it makes it easier for you to see my hands. You're just going to slide this under all the strands of wool. Make sure you get underneath all of them. Wriggle it up to the top, to the spine of the book where the title is, and tie it in a tight double knot. This is going to hold your dolly together. Just get my knot tied. Yeah. 
If you leave long ends like this for the top one, then it means you can tie it to hang up if you like. After that, you just slide it off your book. Yeah. So you can have a little rest at that stage and I am going to show your teachers how you complete it. So the next thing we're going to do, I'm just going to tie a little knot on top of this for hanging it up later. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create the head. So we need another strip of wool. Doesn't need to be quite so long this time. And we're going to come down about a quarter of the way down your loop and tie it tightly round the whole of your wool. So it will pull in like that. Again, tie a really tight double knot and then just trim off your loose ends of wool. Okay, so you get a little bunch at the top, like so. The next stage is to make arms. To make arms, you just pull a few strands out from either side. It doesn't really matter how many, as long as you make it roughly the same each side, otherwise you're going to have one fat arm and one thin arm. So there we go. When you've done that, you're going to tie a little bit of wool round the wrist, if you like, of each dot arm. Let me show you that. I'll just do one side for speed just now, but you'll know to do both sides. There you are. And then you can just trim off the ends like so. We'll give you fingers. To move on next to make our waist. I'm going to do that the same way as we did the head. And the tire for my head has just slid off my dolly, so I'm just going to retie it very quickly, sorry. So under your arms, there's our dolly with her, she has a head again. Just under where your arms are, we're going to tie another bit round all of the wool like you did with the head to give you a waistline, if you like, for your dolly. I will not. Yeah. So now she should look a bit like this. From here, you now have a choice. So we can keep our dolly like this. You can cut through the loops at the bottom, same as we did for the hand, to give you a fringy skirt like this one. Or you can leave them looped up. Or the other thing we can do is we can give our dolly legs. If you think about what we did for the arms, where we just tied a bit of wool around to create a wrist, we're going to do the same for the feet. So we're just going to divide the wool that's left into two. Again, try and make them roughly the same, otherwise you're going to have a fat leg and a thin leg, which I think I have at the moment. <laughs> and we're going to tie a little bit round ankle the same as we did around each wrist. So let me just do that. Unfortunately I can't hold up and tie it at the same time um, because I don't get the knots tight enough and then it all falls apart. Just give me a few second to I tie these off. And again you have a choice at the end. You can cut the loops at the end of the feet to look like the fringy hand that we did already 
or you can leave them as loops. It's completely up to you. You can make your dolly any size. The size is governed by what you wind it round. Um, you can even make tiny, tiny ones and put a safety pin on the back and make them into little badges. It's easier to make a big one first though until you get the idea. Oh, so wrists. Oh, I seem to have a weird bit of rule in the middle. Pair of wrists, pair of feet, head, and mine has a little string to hang it up by. So if you didn't quite manage to get all of that, um, there will be activity sheets for teachers to download afterwards, which gives you all the instructions much slower than we've had to do this morning. So thank you very much for watching and listening. It would be really lovely to see some of your dollies and any plates you've designed. So please send them into um, the team at Eco School Scotland and I look forward to seeing them. Thank you so much, Karen. That was brilliant. Um, I have to say we do really want to see your dollies when you've had a chance to make them. Just while I'm chatting about the next workshop, um, if you'd like to tidy away your yarn and your scissors and everything, and we'll get ready for Jamie's workshop, which is coming up next. Um, so yes, please do show us your dolls. And if you make any printed pottery examples or on paper, we'd love to see them. This is <laughs> this is my dolly. <laughs> this was not easy. <laughs> um, I plaited her little arms, but I didn't I didn't make legs I just she just has a little skirt she doesn't have a hook either but you're right that would be really cool to put on a Christmas tree or to hang on your door and I made this little tiny one as well so these are very fun to make and we'd love to see yours when you have a chance to to make them throughout the week um, maybe if you send us a picture of them we will show as many as we can on our assembly on Friday oh, remember if you have any questions uh, about Karen's workshop, please email them to us at ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org. We'll try to answer a couple today um, and the rest on Friday as we have more time. Um, so just before I introduce my colleague Jamie, I wanted to show you two, pi four pictures. Karen was talking about looking through something called a midden to find traces of people's lives in the past. And it got me thinking that I hadn't seen a midden before and I thought you might like to see a photo of one. So here is um, here's a, a type of midden. Um, this one is very old and is located somewhere where people eat a lot of shellfish. You can see the layer of shells left behind there. And um, this is all from their dinners <laughs> and they've thrown all the rubbish in the midden pile. Now I was going to say pit, but it's more like a pile now. You can see the layer of shells left behind from all the rubbish and everything else has composted or decomposed and is now soil. Here's a closer picture of the same midden um, and you can see all the layers and all this left behind from people who lived here those many years ago. Have a look at this photo and think about what you can see. I was going to have you shout out your answers, but I really need to get along to Jamie's workshop. So just have a think in your head about what you can see or maybe what you don't see. Think about what colors and shapes that you can see or not see in this. I see a lot of brown. I see a lot of shell shapes. I see a lot of natural colors. And then maybe compare it to this, which is a modern landfill, which is where our rubbish, well, our rubbish that isn't recycled or composted goes. And what I notice about this, about the modern landfill, is that it's very colorful. All different shapes and sizes of things, and it's full of plastics, specifically single use plastics which haven't broken down, nor will they ever break down, even after many, many years in landfill. So something to think about after this lesson throughout this week is what do you think this landfill would look like in 100 years from now? Will it look like Ockendrain's midden or will it look like something completely different? Will you still see a lot of this plastic and all these colourful things sticking out of the landfill? What do you think this will tell people in the future about our lifestyle? Is this how we want to live or is there an alternative that could be better? And now I would like to introduce my colleague, Jamie. He also works for Keep Scotland Beautiful and he's going to talk to us about the difference between litter and waste and show us some examples of what we can all do. If you're following along with our experiment today, 
please have your egg boxes and observation charts ready. Don't worry if you're not doing this just now. If you're going to take more time and do it later, that's fine. Have a look at what we are doing and you can you can copy us later on. Remember the quiz at the end of the lesson and pay lots of attention to what you'll hear about reducing litter and waste for that quiz that we've got at the end of the morning. Take it away, Jamie. Thank you very much, Kat. Hi, everyone. So, so happy to be here. I've absolutely loved uh, hearing from Chris and Karen this morning, and hopefully I can uh, uh, finish off with a bit of justice to that as well. Just as I'm uploading my slides, a bit of a side note um, for our students and teachers who um, are calling in from outside of Scotland. Um, just just following on from that midden that um, Kat was describing, my mum used to describe my room as a midden when I was probably your age. So uh, just a bit of a fun fact for you there. Uh, hopefully now everyone can see uh, those slides. Please let us know if you can't. And um, I suppose this, this um, this presentation will be slightly different. I've not got any polls, so you don't need to worry about that if you've been having a problem. Oh, there's a few teachers in the chat. I can see you've been, had their room described as a midden as well. That's good. So yeah, there'll be no polls or anything in this chat, so don't worry. Um, there will be a few uh, questions that I'll ask you, which can be answered as a class. Either you stand up or sit down. You can choose to give your um, give the most common answer in the chat if you want, but you don't have to. So this can be very, it gives uh, your teachers essentially a break from typing too much this session. So you can feel free to keep going and typing in the chat. But again, please ask as many questions as you want, um, but you don't have to um, respond directly to the answers if you don't want to. You can just keep it purely in your class, but it's totally up to you. OK, so I'm going to be talking about litter and waste minimization specifically for this next half an hour, and I'll make sure it's half an hour so that you all get away for your lunch. Um, so let's have a look first off the bat. We've been talking about litter and waste a lot today from different perspectives from Karen and Chris. But are they the same thing? That's the ultimate question. Are they the same thing? OK, you're probably thinking already you can chat in your class now, but what is the difference between litter and waste? OK, again, you can choose to answer just in your class. You can choose to just answer it in your head. I'll give you 15 seconds to think about it before I go over the answer in a little bit more detail. OK, so I know that was quite quick and maybe some of you are still answering it, but that's absolutely fine. Don't worry. Um, but we'll just do this to keep on track and keep on time. That picture is actually quite a big help um, to answering the question and somebody's already mentioned it in the chat. So how do we define them both? Well, when we finish using something, whatever is left is the waste. OK, it only becomes litter when it is discarded in areas rather than bins. OK, so everything, litter always starts off as waste, but it only becomes litter when it's not disposed of correctly. And hopefully you can see that in the bin, uh, in the picture, sorry, that everything that's waste is in the bin, everything that's litter is around the bin. And that goes on to a point as well where we talk about litter attracts more litter. I'm pretty sure that one person didn't drop all that litter next to the bin. People have just seen it walking past and they've just chucked stuff on it because litter attracts more litter. OK, so the next question I'm going to ask you and again, answer it as a class. You can put it in the chat if you want. What are or sorry, what's the number one littered item in the UK? So I've looked at the litter research from all from Northern Ireland, from Wales, from England, from Scotland, and it's actually the same item or items that are littered most common in each country. So we've got straight off what we've we got packets of crisps, crisp bags, plastic bags. OK, plastic bags, plastic bottles. It's not number one. Nobody's got number one yet. Sweetie wrappers, cans, no plastic, a lot of plastic coming up. It's definitely in the top five. Masks, cans, bottles, bananas, chewing gum. Oh, we've got a lot of answers coming through. Still not got number one. 
coffee. Sweet wrappers. Ooh, what have we got? Fast food. We're definitely all getting pretty much the top five, but we've not got number one yet. Oh, somebody said it there. It's popped up. There we go. So the number one, I can't see because it's raced past my screen. We've got cigarette butts, but we've also got um, uh, the e-cigarette cartridges and things as well. So cigarette butts and packaging are a huge blight on our uh, countryside and cities and things like that. Um, 122 tonnes of cigarette butts and cigarette related litter is dropped every day in the UK. OK, up and that takes up to two years for some of these um, for some of these items to degrade even longer if it's the e-cigarettes, because if that's plastic or glass, then that's not really going to degrade at all. Some people already mentioned the others, but yeah, we've got uh, food, uh, food containers, crisp packets, various materials in terms of um, drinks packaging and things like that. In terms of drinks containers, seven out of every 10 items discarded uh, litter is food packaging or wrappers. OK, so there's a lot. You can bunch them very generally into food containers and wrappers, but you can also look more specifically as well. Um, for example, in Scotland especially, but, in, but also in the whole country, you know, chewing gum is a huge problem. It costs about, it costs the, the councils and the government about 50 times as much to get rid of chewing gum as it does to buy a packet of chewing gum. So it's a lot. It's a huge amount. OK, so you see it on the streets, you know, once that's there, that's not disappearing as well. And that goes through the same with a lot of these um, these littered items, depending on the material, it can stay around for sometimes forever, sometimes a short time. But even if you think about orange peels and banana skins and things like that, under the right conditions, they can take up to two years um, to degrade. We've got a great comment in the chat that chewing gum is banned in Singapore, which is which is a really important thing. And we'll get on to sort of the policy and the governments about that a bit later on, but that's a great point. Thank you for pointing that out. So how big is this problem? How big is the litter problem in the UK? Well, I've got some facts for you. So the amount of litter dropped each year in the UK has increased massively since the 1960s. So going back to roughly when your grandparents maybe were your age, it's increased by about 500% the amount of litter dropped in the UK. 500%, okay? That's, so that's been about 50, 60 years. So in the next 50, 60 years, when you're potentially grandchildren are in this situation, we don't want to see, we want to reverse that. OK, so we've got to think how we go about doing it, and that's what hopefully we'll look at some ideas by the end of this presentation. So in terms of cost, that cost of all that litter that drops, that costs councils and governments about 500 million pounds to clear up that litter that's on the streets. But remember, that 500 million pounds, just from the studies that I've been reading, that does not include the amount of cost to clean up in parks and other public places. OK, so that's mainly in cities and things like that. So it's a huge amount of money which could be going to so many other better uses just if we disposed of our litter properly. Um, what is also quite common as well in terms of the behaviour of how people um, how people see litter is that only 48% of people admit to dropping litter. So if you turn to the person next to you, one out of the two of you will admit that you've dropped litter and the other person won't. OK, so that's important to remember that not all of us, um, we all know that it's a bad thing to do, but not all of us admit to doing it. OK, the next we're going to go on to look a little bit about how that litter affects marine pollution. So this really hit me when I was listening to Chris's talk on SSPCA earlier on how that litter that we have can affect marine, um, uh, just marine populations and things like that, um, but also all their, their ecosystems mainly, because it's remembering that 80% of marine litter comes from the land. So all that, all that litter that we're dropping on land, it gets into our oceans and our riverways 
quite easily in some ways. We've got some examples on the screen. So numbers one, two and three are things that we as individuals have a lot of um, a lot of power over to change. So that could be litters dropped in towns or cities. Um, and those and when there's a storm or something like that, it'll go into a storm drain and it eventually gets washed into a river and then out to the ocean and things like that. It could be litter that's dropped at a beach. Depending on where your school is calling in from, you might be close to a beach. You might be close to a river. All these things play a big have a big impact on on how that litter travels and where it gets to. And like we saw in the first picture on the slides, overflowing litter bins. Um, again, if there's a storm, it goes in a storm drain or it just essentially blows somewhere. It could always end up in in uh, a river source. So it's just being mindful to this fact, OK? We don't want to have 80% of our litter going into uh, the oceans. And it's remembering that most of that litter is plastic, OK? We really don't want to do that because it spoils these beautiful places that we live. And it really, down the line, if it continues, it prevents us going from these places as well. Um, Another quick fact as well that every minute the equivalent of one bin lorry of plastic is dumped into our oceans. So I'm delivering this uh, presentation for 30 minutes. That's 30 bin loads worth of plastic litter or waste that's going into our oceans will have happened in that time. OK, it's a huge amount. Plastic pollution is a huge problem for us and the habitats that um, that we live next to and with. So I'm going on just to do a little bit hands up, sit down uh, questions right now. Again, you can just do it in the class. You don't need to post it in the chat, but if you want to have a, you know, a consensus of your answer, please feel free to let us know what it is. So the first question coming up that we have, how many pieces of litter are dropped in the UK every day? If you think the answer is more than 2 million, please sit down. If you think the answer is around 1 million, please stand up, please stand up. So what do you think? I'll give you 10 seconds. I can just imagine students frantically thinking, deciding. More than 2 million seems to be. Everyone sitting down. More than two million. OK, quite a strong consensus. Well, well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. You're absolutely right. It is more than two million every day. Obviously, we want that to be far, far less. So this is something that we've got to work on. 50 50 from from some schools. Next question then. Maybe a bit trickier. How long does it take for a crisp packet to decompose? Sit down if you think it's roughly 40 years. Stand up if you think it's roughly 80 years. OK, so a bit. Less of a consensus on this one, I would say. I would say just from looking at the chat, I think the 80 years maybe just uh, just get it and you would be right. It's about 80 years and this is why we need to be so, so careful about how we discard of our waste. OK, so think about everybody in class now. You might have a packet of crisps for your for your break or your lunch. You might have them every day. You might have them when you go home. You've got to be so, so careful about how you discard of how you discard of those crisp packets because if they're not fully in the bin and you put them somewhere where they could blow out or something like that you know that will have a huge impact which could be impacting the planet for the next 80 years so it's really important to um, take this quite seriously okay the next question coming up how small does a piece of plastic have to be to become a microplastic? I've got some examples here. So we've got five meters or uh, five millimeters or less. Sorry, could you please sit down? So five millimeters is the same 
as the width of a pencil, the thickness of a pencil. Sorry, I'll put that right up to the camera. So the thick, not the length of a pencil, but the actual thickness of a pencil. One millimeter or less, put your hands up. And now that is the thickness of a penny. Very, very thin. So it's not the actual face of the penny, but it's the actual thickness of it. And then it's 10 millimeters or less. And on <laughs> 10 mill millimeters or less from my bit of fact sheet was the size of a pea. But I searched all around my house and I couldn't find a frozen pea anywhere. And I was struggling. I didn't know what to do. Then I was like, OK, you could just half the the or you could double the you could double the width of uh, the diameter of a pencil. So what we got, let's read what everyone's saying. Remember, sit down for five millimeters or less, hands up for one millimeter or less, stand up for 10 millimeters or less. One millimeter, hands up, one, okay. Interesting. So most people, it seems to be, are saying one millimeter. So the actual answer is, five millimeters, which is quite interesting, as you might think, because when you hear the word microplastics, you think micro, you think very, very small, so small that you probably can't see it. But five millimeters or less is actually what it is, because that five millimeters is is big enough to see and to impact your your view. If it's one millimeter or less, it is very difficult and you're close to needing a microscope for it. OK, so it's the answer is actually five millimeters or less. So if you're able to see little bits of plastic on the beach or wherever you are um, and you can see them, then it could still be a microplastic and it's important to know. OK, well done in answering those questions. I think everybody's really good and you all seem to be very clued up on what's going on so far. So let's hear. Um, some good news stories because I've spent the first 15 minutes telling you what's wrong and what's happening and I want you to finish happy and positive and hopeful about what we can do. So the first thing coming up is the good things in terms of policy and what's happening. Sorry, I can't remember the teacher that mentioned the ban on um, um, on chewing gum in Singapore, but we have some wonderful um, developments happening around the world as well. So the Minister of, Ministers of Environment um, from 175 countries around the world um, have agreed a landmark statement to address the full life cycle of plastic from source to sea. OK, so this resolution was agreed at a UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi, which is in Kenya. And essentially what it does, it calls for a treaty covering uh, the life cycle of plastics from production to disposal to be negotiated over the next two years. So this is a huge, huge moment. It's similar to back in 2015 when we talked about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and things like that. This is up there with a huge environmental plan to go ahead to, to reduce or to change the way we view plastics. And hopefully within the next few years, this will be something um, that we really, really see strides towards in terms of cutting down our single use plastic and plastic use in general. We've got some pictures there. One of the pictures there with all the people clapping is from that assembly. So it's great to see. Um, and these, this really will be a historic moment that we feel is happening. But let's look and see what's happening in your schools. OK, so these are all examples from Scottish schools, um, but doesn't matter where you are, where you're calling in from. You can steal these ideas. You can you might be doing them already and um, some of them will fit your context. Some of them won't. But these are things that myself and Catriona have seen um, in our times assessing eco schools applications and just some ideas potentially for you. So you want to create a strong litter policy. That's what the eco schools picture is just there. It's really important that you have this so that everybody's uh, students, teachers, support staff know the rules around litter. You could have competitions to design posters and put them in strategic locations, maybe heav heavily littered areas, hand out eco house points to see if you see people putting things in the bin to reward them for doing something really good. Snack and read is my absolute favourite when I read this from a school. So this school identified they had a huge litter problem in their playground and they bought bins. They did a poster campaign. They did loads of stuff, but they couldn't solve it. 
So they invented this program called Snack and Read. So every break time, five minutes before, all the students would get read to in the class by the teacher and they would eat their snack in class and then they would dispose of their waste before they going before going outside. And this 100% solved their litter problem. I absolutely love these sorts of ideas because it's so simple and it has a huge, huge impact and it costs no money or anything like that either. So it's a it's a win win for for everyone. Other things you could do, you could do competition to design the look of new bins. That's what we've got in the top left hand side or the lot top left picture. Making sure that you have lots and lots of assemblies so that you can share your results and your ideas and the plans and things with the rest of the school, not just with the eco committee, but also speaking with the parents and maybe community as well about what packaging you have in your lunch, if that's where you're getting it from, if it's a packed lunch or if it's a lunchroom school. If we move to how things look outside, OK, so some schools choose to tackle litter um, outside their school grounds once they've tackled it in grounds. So there's lots of things here. We've got student staffs can email council. You can work with your local secondary school. The pictures we have here are from doing a community litter pick on the bottom. We've got um, schools creating uh, dog fouling stations, which is a fantastic idea. And sort of if you have um, dog poo in certain areas, which you think is always there, you could set up your own station. That's a lovely thing to do. But again, having a poster campaign um, would also be a great idea as well. And it's important to remember, you don't just have to do one of these things. You could do all of them. You could do some of them, whatever works for your context. I'm sure there's something from these two slides which can definitely help you, even if it's just one thing that you think that would work great for us. OK, moving forward, what's important to take from all of this litter that we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes is to remember that litter is the ultimate problem, I would say, but we can start it from the source and the source is us. OK, so we've got to rethink how we consume. And this is something a few people have spoken about today already, especially Karen, when we look what's happened at Auckland Drain and things like that, how people used to live versus how we live now. We've really changed how we live and that's having a big impact on our environment. OK, remembering especially when Karen was talking about, you know, children used to have a very few number of toys and now in the UK it's over 500 toys, but we only play with 13 now. So it's a really it's a really big deal. Really big deal. So how do we tackle it? Just going to go over quickly the life cycle of a T-shirt because I'm pretty sure maybe most of you are wearing a T-shirt now. If not, you 100% I think own a T-shirt. So the life cycle of that and the implications for the environment are huge. So look at that, what we see here. You've got to harvest the cotton. You've got to spin and weave it. You've got to construct it. Then you've got to dye it. Then you've got to label it. Then you've got to package it. Then transport it Then send it to a shop. And then you can use it as many number of times until it gets rotten or tatted or you get fed up with it. And then it goes to landfill. And that's the general life cycle of a cotton T-shirt. But there's lots of other things within that which produce which uses a lot of energy or it uses a lot of water and things like that and it's important to know about these things when going forward we've kind of lost our connection to that in so many ways it takes 2700 liters of water to make one cotton t-shirt and it takes you three years to drink that amount that's 2720 of these okay that's what a liter looks like that's a lot to make one T-shirt that we have and some people buy that for a couple of pounds. It gets a hole in it and then you throw it away. And if we've learned anything from Karen in the last um, series of slides, that's what we want to change. You know, can we repair it? Can we do something else with it? All this sort of stuff is really important going forward. OK, we've got a couple other questions that I'm going to um, ask you in terms of sit down, hands up. First one we're looking at, on average, each person in the UK throws away three times their weight in waste every year. Sit down if you think that's true. Stand up if you think that's false. Remember, false could be you think it's more times. So what do we think? Give you 10 seconds. Here we go, first coming in. False, true, 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 true. False, three times true. 
OK. Seems to be quite split, I would say again. Well done if you said false. It's actually five times. So five times our weight is thrown away every year. So that's a huge amount. That's so much that you couldn't even hope to lift that. Um, so it's important to be aware of the amount of waste that we throw away so that we can change how we do that. And there's certain things that you can do. Um, again, we'll go on to talk about it in a, in a bit. So this next question is a scenario. And this is something that we get from schools quite often. So we had a look at the waste we produce and decided to try and recycle some of it. By the end of our first year, we recycled 546 crisp packets and 387 plastic drink bottles. At the end of our second year, we would like to, and this is where you choose, if they, you think they should recycle more, then keep sitting down. If you think they should recycle less, stand up. What do you think? So they've clearly recycled a lot already, but do you think they should recycle more or do you think they should recycle less? OK, so most people are saying A, which is to recycle more. And I'm afraid you've actually fallen into a bit of a trap. OK, <laughs> and I'm sorry to do this, but you should actually be recycling less. OK, and that's remembering because recycling is not the absolute best thing that we could be doing. OK, so we're going to go on to talk about that a bit. Recycling is good, but there are things that we could be doing better. What we want to do is reduce our waste. OK, so we've got to think about how we do that, because when we recycle certain materials, we can only recycle them for a certain amount of time before they become waste. For example, you can only recycle um, plastic a certain number of times. At most, you can recycle plastic about three or four times before you can't recycle it anymore and it becomes waste. For things like glass, you can recycle constantly and forever, so it's good to recycle glass. But things like cardboard, we can only do a couple times. Um, so all that sort of stuff has a huge impact. And it's remembering as well that a lot of our recycling doesn't end up where we think it's going to go. Only about 10% of our household items are recycled. And the government claims that just under half of our recycling heads abroad to other countries. So we're essentially exporting a lot of our waste to other countries to deal with it. And some of the some of the ways that they deal with it is just by burning it. OK, so we've got to be really careful about what we do and how we do it. So I think some people have already mentioned it in the chat already, but we've got things called the three R's, which is reduce, reuse, recycle. But if we expand that even more, there are actually five R's in total. OK, so on the screen you can see recycle, which is A, we've got B, which is refuse, D, which is reduce, uh, C, which is reuse, and E, which is repurpose and repair. Sorry, I said them out of order for some reason. Um, what I would like you to do now is to create a hierarchy for these five R's. So which one do you think that you should do first? Above everything else, which is the most important? And then which do you think should be next if you can't do the first and so on and so on for all five of them? So you're looking at a real hierarchy. When you see a product in the shops, what should you what should be the first R that comes into your head and work your way down? So I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I know it's not a lot of time, but don't worry. I'm going to go over them in more detail on the next slide. Have a think with your class or just individually. Which do you think you should start with and work your way down until you've got all five in an order? OK, we've got some interesting answers coming in. So I'm just very aware of the time and I know I'm probably going to be late and get shouted at, so I'll just keep pushing on. So. I think quite a few people have got the first one, 
which is refuse. OK, so this one can take a lot of practice and it's very difficult depending on your context because it can be a very big behavior change. But you've got to think when you see something, do I need this item? Is there an item that is similar to it, but is more sustainable? So you've got to think first of off, first off, do I need this? Can I refuse it? Can I get something better? Then you've got to look at reducing. So if you have to get something that's non recyclable or not sustainable, can you reduce the amount that you get of it? Because this will all have huge impacts on your carbon footprint or for your school, for example. Um, so you could, for example, replace uh, single use um, eating utensils, styrofoam cups, um, water bottles, paper plates. You can reduce all of that. The third one would be reuse and the important point to remember with reuse is when you buy an item for its original use and you reuse it over and over and again. So an example of this could be a, a metal water bottle, for example. You buy it and you use it over and over again. If you buy a product and then you change its use and then continue to use it for that use, that would then be repurpose. OK, so that could be things like that you use for your art projects, for example. If you get a whole bunch of um, yogurt pots, for example, and you paint them and you put them onto a piece of paper and you're making an art project with them, that's then you repurposing that yogurt pot. But remembering then from that, you can no longer recycle that yogurt pot because it's been painted on and things like that. So it's important to really remember this sort of stuff and think about what's going to happen with this art project, for example, when I've finished gluing and sticking things all over it. And the final one is recycle. So essentially the absolute minimum we should all be doing in schools, in our personal lives, everything is recycling. OK, and if your school doesn't have a recycling policy, get shouting at them and come up and design with one because you absolutely need one. It's the start to all of this. OK, you can start small, you can start with recycling and work your way up or you can go big um, and start from the top and work your way down. So let's have a look and see how schools are fighting back with their waste problems. And um, we've got some fantastic examples here. So extensive promotion of the three or five hours like I've just been doing. You could have your own compost food waste. The school in the top left created um, a greenhouse using water bottles. Even just the simple things of labeling your bins that was on the top right, because some students, whether it's P1, whatever, they might not know with your five colored bins what should go in where. So it's really, really important to label them correctly so that all students of all ages can can understand where things go. Um, what else have we got? TerraCycle. I'm not sure if that's a nationwide thing. I'm pretty sure it is, but that's recycling um, crisp packets or repurposing crisp packets, actually, I should say, because they're made into garden furniture and things like that. Um, end of year toy swap. So again, that makes me think back to the 500 toys that every 13 year old has. Imagine if we you know, were able to set up a toy shop and everybody was able to swap their toys. You know, that would be able to have a huge impact on what was bought. Um, food bank donations, metal cutlery, metal or paper straws, um, end of your clothes and uniform swap. You'll see from all of this, it's not rocket science and none of nothing is huge. But if all 350 or so schools who are on here right now could do that, it would have a huge, huge impact. So it would be so good um, if we could all go down that route. Doing a waste survey also really important. And we've got another page. So another page of what things waste free Wednesdays. I heard some people, uh, some comments were saying they have waste free Fridays or whatever, things like that. All that sort of stuff has has a great impact. Canteen and pupil and staff meetings. So involving your staff, involving your pupils is key to all of this because you want it to be a whole school thing and not just an eco group type thing. Um, enterprise projects, energy monitors for energy waste, because remembering, you know, there's also waste in not physical forms, but in energy forms as well. Um, book swap donation, change from single use plastics wherever possible, such as lunch aprons and nursery. There are so, so many ideas. Um, the one I want to just highlight the the, the simple ones as well. The frog with the bin cover is such a good one because the school noticed that their waste was blowing out of it and becoming litter. So they just put a plastic flap on it and it solved their problem. It was so good. Um, the bottom right is they've reduced the size of the plates. 
um, so that there was less food waste for the younger students because they noticed that P1 students were getting the same portion sizes as P7s. It's a huge difference if you're that age. So things like that will have a huge impact. Um, and we use the top right one as a bit of a bad example, but they had their heart was in the right place. They've used, you probably can't tell from that picture, but they've used bottle tops to make that entire sign and they've painted each one. But like I said before, it's a great poster and it looks lovely, but now those bottle tops can't be recycled because they're covered in paint and glue. So it's really important to remember how you use the materials you have and what you're using them for. Okay. Activity time. I'm five minutes late. I'm going to get shouted at, but I need my magician's assistant cat back up on the screen, please, and I'll go over the activity that you have. Hello. Hello. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. OK, folks, so hopefully that stopped sharing. And I'll turn my camera off so you can just see cat as well, because she is going to be uh, showing you everything while I narrate everything. <laughs> OK, folks, so some of you might have the uh, resources already. Don't worry if you don't. This is something you can do later. Um, but this is an experiment to essentially test um, how th how certain materials decompose over time. So I'll go over the first three points, um, which you can do in class, and then we recommend for the other for the other three or four points. Um, you can discuss with your teacher how you want to do that, but it can be a bit messy, so we would recommend doing it maybe not during a live lesson. So, so per group or table and using felt pens, pupils should write their names on the lid of the boxes or box and the number each egg space in the box. So Kat has wonderfully shown us she's got a dozen egg space, she's got 12 slots and she's written what each slot is going to contain. So we've got takeaway cup, we've got cardboard, we've got crisp packet, banana peel, eggshell, compostable dog poo bag, regular dog poo bag, cardboard, tetra pack, fruit punnet plastic, pear skin, paper and disposable mask. Don't worry if you don't want to do 12, you can do six, that's absolutely fine, or you can do 12 and do it with a partner, absolutely fine. Um, yeah, also per group or table, pupils should write their names on the observation grid and fill in the number of egg spaces they will be testing in their boxes. So uh, Kat has kindly shown us that as well. So it would be great if you could do that because obviously this is going to how you're going to record your data um, over time, over the number of days. If you're not sure that the pupils will be able to see the numbers in each space once they fill them in the experiment, ask the pupils to draw a grid on the inside of the lid that will represent each of the egg spaces which we've already spoken about and number them accordingly. So as you can see, that's what Kat's pointing to right now and she's um, very cleverly put the date as well for when it all starts and you can see all our objects in the bit of compost there. So I'm not going to go over four points four to seven because I've I remember correctly they should be in the um the pack that was sent to the teachers is that right Kat? Yeah. Yeah no problem so you'll be able to access but it does make a bit of a mess so it's probably not best to do it now. This is what it looks like when you're finished. Oh here's one I made earlier. <laughs> Always wanted to say that. Yeah same. <laughs> So folks, I know I'm 10 minutes late, so thank you so much. I'm going to hand you back to Kat now. I hope everybody's been paying attention to the quizzes and I hope you've had a lovely time. I've had a great time doing this for the last 30, 35 minutes. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. I'm going to keep my experiment running for the next few days. Um, and I hope that you will too, once you've had a chance to set yours up. We'd love to see them. Again, if you want to show us on social media, on email, if you don't use social media, um, because we can't see you, unfortunately, we're going to have to make do with you sending us pictures. So please do when you have the chance. Um, there's so many examples in that presentation, Jamie, that could work in every school. So thank you so much for sharing that. I wanted to tell you one more thing that you can do to take on litter in your community. Um, it's something else we'd like you to consider as part of your eco schools work. It's one of the easiest actions we can take on litter and that is carrying out a litter pick or a survey in your community. What better time to do that than by participating in a spring clean campaign in your community? 
right? There's me with some of my best pals out picking litter not that long ago. So we're asking schools all over the UK to pledge to make litter history this spring, pledging to pick up bags of litter in your community. Now, I'll let you in on a secret. Some people that we talk to in our work think that young people don't care about litter or the environment at all, but we know that you do or you wouldn't be joining us this morning and you wouldn't be doing eco schools. So please pledge for your class or by yourself to pick up as many bags of litter as you can. And then we'll share how many pledges we get to show how much people across the UK really do care. And then when you have picked up your litter, please show us because we want to see the results of your litter pick. Share, us, share with us on social media or by email. And we'd love to share your stories in our newsletter as well. So here's how you can get involved wherever you live in spring clean campaigns with all of the tidy organizations as we call ourselves. If you live in England, it's called the Great British Spring Clean, hashtag GB School Clean or Spring Clean. And you visit keepbritaintidy.org to find out how to take part. If you live in Scotland, it's called Spring Clean Scotland, although we do support the Great British Spring Clean as well. Um, and you would go to keepscotlandbeautiful.org to take part. If you're in Wales, it's called Spring Clean Cymru, and you would go to keepwalestidy.com to take part. If you're in Northern Ireland, the dates are slightly different. It's the 1st of March to the 1st of May, slightly longer than the other tidy groups, and you would go to Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful to take part. Please remember to register your events and tell us what you're doing, because by sharing what young people are up to is how we make a lot of difference in inspiring other people to take part and make a difference too. Now, whoop, <laughs> not too fast. First, I wanted to tell you one thing that we will be sending a, um, a evaluation to see how you think we did today. We'll be sending that to your teachers. So please do look out for that um, so that you can give us any feedback that you might have. We have um, a time for a couple of your questions. Actually, one of your questions I think we're going to do today. Um, we got so many and actually some of them, some of us have to go away and do some homework. So we'll be answering those on Friday because you lot ask some tricky questions. <laughs> The question we're going to do today is from Caden from P4 Linecraigs Primary School. Wants to know, do the Scottish SPCA take care of every animal? So Chris, would you mind taking a moment to answer this question for us, please? Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you very much indeed for this question. That's a, that's a great one. The unique thing actually about the SSPCA is that we will take care of any animal that needs help. Whatever happened to them, whatever, um, whatever medical situation they're in, if they're stuck, if they're trapped, if they're lost or they, they've just wandered out in the road, we will come and help them out. That includes wild animals, pet animals, farm animals, even if it had escaped from the zoo, whatever it is, if it needs help and you're in Scotland, the right thing to do is to give us a call and we'll come and help it out. So thank you very much indeed for that question. Thank you, Chris. That's a brilliant answer. And now the moment you have all been waiting for. Here's our quiz. Now, don't post your answers in the chat, <laughs> OK? What we want you to do is to send your answers in an email along with your school's name and where you are. One entry per class, please. So get together and think about your answers together. We'll send this around to everyone after the event as well so that you have a list of the questions. Give it some thought, OK? And remember, all entries with the correct, with three correct answers will go into the draw for the virtual tour from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. We'll, answer, we'll announce our winner at our assembly on Friday, so I hope that you can all join us. And sadly, that is all we have time for today. So I hope you've enjoyed our morning. I know I certainly have. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'd like to say a special thank you to our guest presenters, Chris from the Scottish SPCA and Karen from Auchindrain Historic Township. Of course, thank you to Jamie as well. <laughs> and thank you too to our friends from Keep Wales Tidy, Keep Britain Tidy and Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. If you've enjoyed today, please do consider attending our next two lessons in May and June on biodiversity and water. Details of how to join us then are on our website at keepscotlandbeautiful.org slash ecoschools and everyone is welcome. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Um, the recordings will be up as soon as they are available. Bye for now.